His father is the eighth Imam, Ali ibn Musa Rida, sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi. And his mother was a Nubian, African lady. She had several titles or names. Among them was Durrah. Among them was Al Khayzuran. Among them was Rayhana. Among them was Sabika. This created the first challenge for Al Imam Jawad. His mother was African. So therefore, when he was born, the genetics played a role, and therefore he was darker skinned. This was one of the first challenges he experienced. To the point where Bani Hashim, Al Hassaniyun, Wal Alawiyun, Wal Husayniyun, not the Abbasiyun, leave those aside, his own cousins. They criticized Al Imam al Rida and said that. Is he really your son? They started doubting Al Imam al Rida. He told them, He's my son, but they wouldn't believe him. They said, We have to bring an expert, someone who back then they used to call him Al Qafa, Yaktafi. This person had some expertise. He would look at the faces of people and he would tell, this is the father, this is the uncle, this is the cousin, this is etc, etc. They had that kind of expertise. They brought one of those off, an Imam of Rida, the Imam of their time is telling them that he's my son. They don't listen to the Imam of the time. And he's their own cousin or brother. We're talking about al hasaniyuna wal alawiyun Sadat. These are Sayyids. They don't listen to him, they listen to this man. A stranger who comes and has some expertise. Imam al Rabba alayhi salam said, This is what you want to do, you can do it. They said, Okay, but we want you to attend. You have to be present with your son. He said, Okay. So they gather. They gather at somebody's house. And all of them gathered, the Hassaniyun, Wal Husayniyun, and descendants of Imam Al Hassan Wal Husayn Ali Masala. They gather and they bring this man. They tell Imam Al Jawad Ali Salam, they tell him, You stay outside in the garden. You stay in the garden. So Imam Al Rabah is told, You stay outside. You stay in the garden. So he started gardening. He started taking the garden, you know, looking after the garden. And they sat down. Then they told this man, okay, do you see this boy? He said, yes. He said, tell us, who is related to him? So he looked at Al Imam Al Jawad alayhi salam and he turned and said, this is his uncle, this is his cousin, this is etc., this is so and so, this is so and so. They asked him, who is the father? He saw the back of Al Imam al Rabba in the garden. But he hesitated to say something. He didn't realize this was Ali ibn Musa al Rabba. He thought this was like the gardener, the person who just looks after the garden. And he realized he is the father of this boy. So he hesitated to say he is the father. You know, maybe this will create a problem. They told him, no, say, who is the father? He said, if you really insist, that gardener is the father. So at that point, Kabbaran Hashimi. They said, Allahu Akbar. And now they confirm that he is the son of Imam al Rabba alayhi salam. The Imam tells them he is my son, they don't listen. This man tells them he is the son, they listen. This gives us a very important lesson in this day and age. In this day and age, especially youngsters, sometimes your parents tell you something, parents say something, children don't listen. 
some stranger comes, says the same thing, they listen to the stranger. Sometimes, Marja al-Taqlid says something, people don't listen. Some stranger on YouTube, whom we don't know who he is, one of those people whom they call these days influencers. One of the influencers comes up, whom you don't really know, what is he expert in? No expertise, other than entertaining people and gathering people's attention. But people listen to him, they follow him. And I'm not surprised at these people, the influencers. They, they're always existed, these people. But I'm surprised at the people who listen to them. Just like these individuals. They had seen an Imam of Rabba he's their cousin, he's their brother, they lived with him. And Imam of Rabba alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed the birth of an Imam al Jawad alayhi salam until Imam of Rabba was 45 years of age. So compared to the rest of the Imams, he was old. He was really old compared to the rest of the Imams, for example, alayhi salam. At the age of 45, and he did not have any boys, any children. So they lived with the Imam for 45 years. They know him. But subhanAllah. So that was one of the first challenges. One of the people who narrates the story, one of them who was sitting there, was Ali ibn Ja'far, Ali Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, the son of Imam al-Sadiq, Ali ibn Ja'far, yani the uncle of Imam al-Ghabar, Ammu al-Ghabar his. his uncle. So when he heard this, when he saw this, he jumped at an Imam al-Jawad, salam Allah alayhi, he was a little boy at the time. He jumped at him, he started kissing his hand and his feet, and he said, Anta Imam, you are my Imam. You're the son of Ali ibn Musa, Allah, Anta Imam. Good, at least he submitted to the Imam Salam. So that was the first challenge. Because of his dark skin, his mother was Nubian, African, people did not accept that. And again, this is something we experience even in this day and age. Sometimes people who come from certain tribes, they say, we are from this tribe. These guys have a lower tribe. Or sometimes some Arabs say, we are Arabs. These are non Arabs, for example. Although in Akramakum and Allah at Qaq, at one of the greatest companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was who? Salma. Salma the Arabian. One of the greatest companions. In fact, of the companions, we put Ahlul Bayt aside, alayhi wa sallam, and Ibn Mu'mineen, wal Hassan, wal Husayn, alayhi wa sallam, was the one society. Of the companions, he may have been the best of the companions. Of the Ashab. Of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So, that's Salma. Among the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, some of them were non Arabs. John, African. Aslam, Turkish. But unfortunately, people still live in this mentality. I am from this tribe. It's good. It's good if we can overcome this. Look at the person, who he is, his akhlaq, his manners. Not what tribe and all that stuff. Of course, that's important sometimes. We're not saying don't look at the tribe. But the akhlaq and the a'mal and the deeds. That's one challenge. Second challenge that Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam faced. His young age when he be, took the responsibilities of him. This was a big challenge. And Imam Allah, as I mentioned, alayhi salam, was about 45 years of age when he had an Imam al Jamal salam in the year 195 after Hijab. In the year 203 after Hijab, an Imam al alayhi salam, was martyred. He was killed. So Ali Imam al Jawah was about seven or eight years of age, give or take. The first time the Shia has seen an Imam at the age of seven. To them, he's a boy, he's a child. How could a child be the Imam? One of the Shia by the name of Ali ibn Asbat, he's Egyptian from Egypt. 
He says, I came to Medina wanting to see the Imam so that I can go back to Egypt and describe him to the Shia in Egypt. He said, I came to Medina, I arrived, I waited by his door. I asked, where is the house of Imam al-Jawad and so on and so forth. They told me, so I waited. And then Imam al-Jawad came out of the house. He said, I started looking at him head to toe. You know how sometimes you really look at someone carefully and your eyes move and your head moves. He's carefully trying to scan the Imam alayhi salam so that he can describe him to the people of Egypt. But in his mind, in his mind he was thinking, it's like, how am I going to describe him to the people of Egypt? What am I going to tell the people of Egypt? He's a seven, eight year old boy. He's your Imam. This is the Imam al Masoom. Hujjatullahi fi Abdullah. So he said, he, Al Imam al Jawad looked at me and he said, Ya Ali. So that's the first sign. Ali ibn Asfar did not tell him, I am Ali ibn Asfar. The Imam looked at him and he said, Ya Ali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the same argument that goes in Nubuwa applying to Imam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيًّا about Yahya عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا وَآلِهِ وَعَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ and he says, لما بلغ أشده وبلغ أربعين سنة. So Allah can give the signs of Nubuwa, the essence of Nubuwa to a boy who's sabi or to a man who's 40 years old. The same applies, nothing changes. So Ali ibn Asfar says, when I saw this, oh, this is bad. First of all, he knows my name. Second of all, he knows what I was thinking about. And so, the Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam slowly started meeting people, talking to people, and then people started to realize, no, he is an Imam al Masoor. He is Imam. Even though he's only seven years old. And of course, this is extremely important because this paved the way to the Imam of al Madi al Muntabar, Jalallahu Ta'ala, Al Sharif. An Imam. Our Imam was five years of age. But the Shia had had two experiences before. One Imam al Jawad alayhi salam, who was about seven years of age, and Imam al Jawad's son, Al Hadi alayhi salam, was about eight years old. So they had seen two cases, one after the other, where the Imam could be seven, eight, and therefore five is also acceptable. So this was the second challenge Al Imam al Jawad alayhi salam faced. Salam Third challenge that he faced. Was his loss of the father at a young age. As I mentioned, seven years of age, and he lost his father at Imam al Although he is an Imam al Masoom, he's an Imam Masoom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imams don't go by age. Isa ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam, the Prophet. He was few hours old. Few hours old. And he said, Inni Abdullah atani al kitaba wa ja'alani nabiyya. Allah has given, I am the servant of Allah, He's given me the book, and He's made me a Prophet of Allah. That's why when the people used to argue with Imam al Ridha alayhi salam, they say, Who will be the Imam after you? He would say, He, him, my son. They look at him, they say, He's five years old, or three years old, he's very young. He said, So what? Isa alayhi salam was few hours old, and he spoke and he said, I am a prophet of Allah. He is at least older than Isa when he spoke. So, what's the problem with this? Although he's Imam al Masoom. But of course, losing the father is not easy. And this is an important thing for us, brothers and sisters. And I want a little bit of attention in this matter. These days, life is very busy. Many parents, 
go to work early in the morning until night. Brothers and sisters, it is important. Please pay attention to this. It is extremely important in this day and age. It's always been the case, but today it's a little bit more challenging to spend time with our children. Make sure you invest time with your children. When you come home, sit down with them, speak to them, teach them, educate them. Today, there are so many things that are happening in the world, and the world is at their fingertips. We don't know what are they listening to, what are they watching, who are they playing games with? All these are extremely important. A man comes to an Imam al comes to Imam al he says, I saw him sitting down and he had a banana in his hand and he was feeding an Imam al Jawar He's giving it to him. So the man says, Yahya al-Sana'ani. He said, I looked at Imam al Jawar and Imam al Jawar and I told him, is he the son? Is he the promised one, inshallah, after you? He said, yes. He said, there is no child born in Islam. In Islam. Ma wulida mawludun fil Islam. A'amu barakatan min hada. There is no child born in Islam greater in blessing than him. Now this itself some of the ulama said, we have to think about this statement. How could it be the case? We have al Hassan born in Islam, al Hussein alayhi salam born in Islam, Ali al sajjad and so on and so forth. What does Imam al-Rabah alayhi salam mean? That in Islam, no child is more mubarak than him who's been born. That statement alone requires a lot of discussion. But this is not the time for it. The point is, Al Imam al Rabah is sitting with his son, feeding him, giving him the banana, talking to him, having his conversation with him. How many of us invest so much time with our children? This is very important, brothers and sisters. Please pay attention to this. Make sure you invest time. I remember once I had a man come to me, and his son was about 14 years of age. He brought his son to me. He says, Sheikh, my son is starting to have some strange ideas about Allah, about the creation of this universe, and so on and so forth. 14 year old, maybe even younger, 13 year old, 14. So I sat down with the son, I started talking to him, I told him, what's going on? And he started saying things, things that don't make sense. But when I try to use logic, he doesn't understand logic. And you try to go point by point that this is not right because this is... He doesn't understand it. He changes the argument. He says, oh, well, what if this, this, is this? Well, I tell him, well, this would be the answer. Well, well, what if this, 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 this? He changes the answer. 13, 14 year old. Then I told him, where did you get all these ideas from? He said, from YouTube. What? I told him, yes, I wouldn't be surprised if you I'm answer. I'm just as surprised as you are. From YouTube. So I told the father, have you been paying attention to what your son has been listening to on YouTube? Look for it. Be careful. So sometimes there are things over there that would really deviate people. So be careful. The games. How many of the children here play games? MashaAllah. for being honest. Thank you for being honest. Do we as parents know who are our children playing with? What games are they playing? Do you notice sometimes you walk into their room, in their room they have all the PlayStation and the whatever game it is that they have, and they have the headphones, and they're playing. Who are they playing with? What are they playing? No idea. That's something important. Ask. Who are you playing with? What are you playing? How long have you been playing? That's why I usually advise the mu'mineen, don't put these games into the bedroom, put them in the living room. At least you're there, or the mother is there, one of the parents are there to see what's going on, what's happening. And ask 
the ball you're playing with. You can see the games, you can see this. And so that's important because otherwise it will create a big problem. So this is a challenge that we have in this day and age. Just like Imam Riwa invested time with his son, we need to invest time with our sons as well and our daughters. To teach them akhlaq. If you find your son or daughter saying something that is not respectful, teach him, teach her. This is not akhlaq, this is not how we talk. If you find them doing something wrong, educate them. It's important. One of the people in Khurasan, Khurasan, he says, every time Imam al-Riba would speak of his son, the Imam al-Jawar alayhi salam, he calls him Abu Ja'far, the kunya of the Imam, Imam al-Jawar, his kunya is Abu Ja'far. He doesn't say my son Muhammad, he says Abu Ja'far. And that's out of respect. So he gives respect to his son, al-Imam al-Jawar salam. That's important. So that's a third challenge that the Imam faced, Salam Allah He lived a short life with his father, the Imam al The fourth challenge that the Imam faced was his marriage to the daughter of al mamun al-Abbasi, whose name was Zainab and her title was Umm al Umm al al mamun al-Abbasi, the Khalifa, he was the one who poisoned the Imam of Riba Now, Ma'moon, my dear brothers and sisters, was probably the most exceptional Khalifa. And by Khalifa, I mean the title of Khalifa. Otherwise, we use kings. He's not a Khalifa king. Khalifa to Rasulullah is the true Haq, the Khalifa to Haq. These are kings. But out of these kings from Bani Umayyah and Bani Al Abbas who ruled, he was the most exceptional. Very exceptional. In his intellect, but in an evil way. Daha'uhu wa makro, as they say, makra, daha. He was not ugly. He was exceptional. And interestingly, he was probably one of the most evil. Most, most of these khulafa, or so called khulafa, when they wanted to kill an imam, they wouldn't kill him themselves. They would hold him people to do the job. al Mahmoud did the job himself. He took a poison thread and he poisoned grapes himself with his hand and poisoned some pomegranates himself. And then he gave them to Al-Imam al to make sure that he gets poisoned when they are. That's al Mahmoud al-Abbas. After poisoning Al-Imam al-Rabbah, killing him, later, he got his daughter to marry an Imam al Jawad. That is to add pressure on the Imam. This way he can keep an eye on the Imam 24 7. And his wife is with him. You have a spy in your house 24 7. That added so much pressure. Al Ma'mun al Abbasi died in the year 218 after Hijrah. Imam Jawad was killed in the year 220, and two years after Al Mahmoud, by Mahmoud's brother Al Mu'tasim. Al Mu'tasim became the Khalifa after his brother. When Al Mahmoud died, Imam Al Jawad السلام, said, "Our relief is coming soon now. Our relief." And imagine how much pain he was living in with Al Mahmoud Al Abbasi and Al Mu'tasim Al Abbasi. That he says, now we will have relief soon. And indeed, two years later, he was killed. So a lot of pain, a lot of pressure. And it was this Umm al Fadl who killed him. She conspired with Al Murtasal, her uncle, to kill and poison an Imam al Jawad. So that was a big challenge. A big challenge for an Imam al Jawad. To have such an individual. But al Imams, our Imams, alayhi we don't have one incident where al Imam al Jawad with Umm al Fadl using bad language against her, humiliating her. Even though she was the lady who poisoned him, he dealt with her with respect. 
And he tried to guide her. And all these years she lived with Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. Remember, our Imam alayhi salam, one of the roles of the Imam al-Mansur is Hidayah. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا Hidayah, they guide. The role of the Mansur, one of his important roles is Hidayah. So an Imam wants to die, even his wife, Umm al -Fawr. So she lived with him all these years, she saw his great akhlaq, his great respect. That's why some people unfortunately, they don't. But despite how she was, he always treated her with respect. And that's important, how we treat our spouses, how we deal with them, with respect, with dignity. That's important. Giving this akhlaq of Al Imam Al Jawar alayhi salam. Last challenge, and we'll finish with this inshaAllah, that Imam Al Jawar alayhi salam faced, of course, is the political pressure. He was living under Al Ma'mun al Abbasi and Al Mu'tasir, his brother. And this was during the peak of the oppression of the Abbasi dynasty against the Shia from Al Mansur al Dawaliqi, from the Mansur Abu Ja'far al Mansur, until about Al Mutawakkil's time. After Al Mutawakkil, things started to get out of the hands of the Khulafa, the Khalifa. After him, it was the guards, the guards who started to take power. Al Mu'tasib al Abbasi, interesting himself, he brought people who were Turkish, Turkish mercenaries from Turkish. Not from Turkey. The Turks originally are not from Turkey. The Turks moved to Turkey. Those of you who read history, you'll find a Sultan Rahman and hence the Ottoman Empire. He surrounded Constantinople. And then he died. His son. Mahmoud, Sultan Mahmoud opened Constantinople and the Turks then came into what's called today Turkey. Otherwise, was Constantinople, al Constantinia, Europe, part of Europe. So, and they were Christians. That's when they came to Turkey. Originally, they're not from that region. Originally, they're from what we call today that region northern of Iran. In North Iran today, if you look at that region, Turkmenistan, those regions, that's where they're originally from. Nonetheless, Al Mu'tazam al Abbasi brought these Turkish mercenaries. He brought them to kill his, oh, anyone who is against him, his enemies, to fight against his enemies. And then they became, there was too many of them in Baghdad, so the people complained. They said, What is this? Baghdad now is full of mercenaries. So he moved them. He moved them to Samarra, Surah al Raha. And hence the capital of the Abbasis moved to Samarra, or Surah al Raha. And therefore, the Khulafa who came after him, they were in Samarra. By the time of Al Mutawakkil, the end of Al Mutawakkil, these mercenaries became the rulers, became the ones who got all the power. As one of the poets, he says, خليفة في قفص بين وصيف وبها يرددان أو يرد يردد ما يرددان له كما تردد البببها. Watch it. Sorry, خليفة. Became like a parrot. Whatever those Turkish mercenaries, those rulers, he became the guards and the military was in their hands, so they became the ones in power. Al Mu'tasim al Abbasi, of course, put a lot of oppression, just like his brother Al Mahmoud, and like before him was Harun, and those other Abbasi caliphs. So there was a lot of oppression against Al Imam al Jawad's Muhammad, political oppression. One day, Al Mu'tasim, he says to his guards and we ministers, he says, I want you to write letters against Al Jawad, Muhammad ibn Ali, so we can arrest him. Fabricate, fabricate 
implies that he is planning to have a revolution against me. So this way we can arrest him and kill him. So they made some reports and he brought Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam and he told him, you are trying to have a revolution against me. He said, who told you? He said, these advisors of mine, they have written documentation from your Shia. Your Shia have leaked information that you are planning a revolution against me. And Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam raised his hand and he said, Allahumma, oh Allah, if you know that they are lying, then show them. Show them. The ground where they were sitting started to shake. Shake. Like an earthquake. An earthquake started to happen. To the point where Al Mu'tasim turned to the Imam. He said, Stop, just, just make it stop, make it stop. Thumbs. We made a mistake and we did not do anything. He turned to Allah and he said, Ya Allah, you know that they are your enemies and my enemies. A'da'uka wa a'da'u. These are the people, al Mu'tasim and all those guys. These are. They are your enemies and my enemies. But make the ground stop. So the ground stop. So Imam al Jawad was always under such pressure where the Khalifa tried to find ways of killing the Imam Salah, even if it's fabricating lies for the other one. One day, a thief came to Ali to the Khalifa and Mutasan al Abbasi. And he said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen to the Khalifa. I stole, I stole something, I'm a thief. فَطَهِّرْ مِي يعني make, make me, punish me so that I become Qahir. I made a mistake. I don't want to go back to stealing, so I want to repent. Punish me so that خلص, at least I get my iqaq, my, my consequence in dunya, and inshallah I won't get punished in the Akhir. The Khalifa, Khalifa to Rasulullah, as he claims himself to be, he doesn't know what to do. Adam Khalifa. This is the ruler. This is the ruler. A man who claims to be Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He's sitting in the pulpit of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In the place where the Prophet needs to sit or the Khalifa of Rasulullah needs to sit. And he does not know Hukum al Ahkam. He doesn't know. Adam. These are the Khalifas. So he turns, he says, invite the Fuqaha, bring the Fuqaha, the scholars. See what they say, the jurists. And invite Muhammad ibn Ali. Also give him as well. So they got everybody. The place was full, full of people. He turns to them and he says, What do you guys think? Mufti Diyar. Mufti Diyar. A man by the name of Ibn Abi Dawood. Ahmed ibn Abi Dawood. Mufti Diyar. He said, Ya Amir al Muminin. You should cut his hand from the wrist here. And Muqtasar tells him, what's your proof? What's your evidence? He says, because Ayat al tayyamu in the Quran, Allah says, wipe your hand. And the hand in tayyamu is from here. So therefore, Ayat al tayyamu shows that this is the hand. And hence, we need to cut his hand from the wrist. And some of the fuqaha agreed. They said, yes. Another group of fuqaha, they said, no, you should cut the hand from the elbow. He said, what's your evidence? He said, because ayatul wudu. Ayatul wudu says, and wash your arm or your hand. The hand up to the elbow. So therefore, the definition Ayatul wudu is the hand up to the elbow. This is where you need to cut from here. So the fuqaha, each one is saying one thing, and each one is quoting the Quran. Each one is quoting the Quran. This is also an important lesson for us, brothers and sisters. Not anyone who quotes the Quran is a Yahya understands the Quran. 
These people knew Arabic. They were scholars of Arabic language. Arabic was their forte. They understand Arabic. But they don't understand the Quran. Ahkam Allah is for Khalifa Allah. Hujjah Allah. He is the one who determines for Allah. So Al Muhtasan turns to Al Imam Al Jawad and says, Wa ma qawlu kafiha. And what do you say? Imam Al Jawad looked at him and he said, Well, they gave you an answer. He didn't want to answer. So they already answered you. He said, no. He said, Da'ni min ma qalu. He said, leave what they said. I don't care about what they said. Tell me what you say. The Imam says, but they gave you the answer. He said, Aqsamtu alayka billah. I swear upon you by Allah. Give me the answer. What do you say? He said, now that you swear upon me by Allah, I have to tell you that what they said is wrong. He said, what do you say? He says, you cut the hand from these four fingers. Right. That's it. Just as a side note, brothers and sisters, I know some of you would say, why is Islam so harsh? Somebody's told and you cut the hand. Why is Islam so harsh? First of all, pay attention to this. There are, according to some fuqaha, more than 18 or 20. Some of the fuqaha, say that we can say this delay, this is 21. Condition before cutting the fingers. And there are conditions. If a person, for example, is starving, they're living in oppression, where they're starving to death, there you don't cut out people's hands. This punishment is made for people who have everything that they have. They have everything, but they still steal. Let me give you an example. You guys know the former president of the United States? That man? I was reading on the year of his election, the year when he was, you know, when, they, when he lost the election. That year. The election was in November. If you remember, the election was in November when he lost the election. In January of that year, in January, I was reading in the New York Times. It is said that in the New York Times, in January, his golfing costs taxpayers $110 million since he's become the president. You know, being a president is a stressful job, so he needs to relieve some stress. And where does he relieve the stress? He goes to his own golf clubs, the club that he owns, and he charges taxpayers. So let the taxpayers pay for my golfing so that I can relax. He can relax. How much? $110 million. That's until January. Yani until November. God knows then what number what's the number. 110 million in the United States itself, in the United States, leave alone other countries in the world. It is reported that one in six children are hungry, malnourished in the United States. One in six children don't have dinner, don't have lunch. They're hungry in the US. Imagine this 110 million dollars if it were spent on this issue. How many children would be fed? That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, no person goes hungry except because there is a rich man who deprived him. He's responsible for his hunger. Either he doesn't pay his dues, al hukuk al shari he doesn't pay his khums, his zakah, or worse, he steals, like these people. So now you know why there's so many poor people in the world? It is such individuals, such individuals, when they steal from the people. Now, it may be said that it's legal. He's doing his legal. We say yes, legal and maybe the judicial system. But ethically, is it legal? Morally, is it legal? You have so many children dying, malnourished. Leave alone in the world, in the US itself. And the president spends $110 million when he himself, mashallah, is a billionaire. And 
he could spend $110 million himself out of this pocket if he wants to go golfing. You see? Such individuals, that's why Islam put this kind of a punishment. When you have such people stealing from the others, then they deserve to have that kind of punishment, to deter them from doing this kind of act, so that millions of people don't go hungry and die. So this is just to explain to you why Islam put this system in there. First of all, there are so many conditions. Second, it is there to deter people so that justice can be established. Anyways, Al Imam Al Jawad says that these four fingers must be cut off. Al Mu'tasim said, What's your evidence? What's your proof? He said, First of all, Sunnah to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sunnah, the Hadith. What does the Hadith say? He said, The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when people go to sujood, seven parts of the human must touch the ground, must touch the floor. The forehead, the two hands, the two knees, and what else? The toes, that's right. So when you do sujood, these seven parts of the body must touch the ground. That's the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the sunnah. Then it says, and Allah says in the Quran, now he brings his hands from the Quran. And Allah says in Surah Al-Jinn, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحْرًا Masajid here, for those who speak Arabic, جَمْعُ مَسْجَدْ لَا مَسْجِدْ عَلَى تَفْسِيرْ هَذَا الْإِمَانِ عَلَى تَفْسِيرْ الْإِمَانِ عَلَى هَذَا التَّفْسِيرْ مَسَاجِدْ مُمْكِنْ كُنْ جَمْعْ مَسْجِدْ وَمُمْكِنْ جَمْعْ مَسْجَدْ مَسْجِدْ فُرْ Masjid, Masjid. Masjid, Masjid. Masjid. So, in this definition, interpretation of the Imam, he says that Allah says in the Quran, the places of sujood, Masjid, belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot touch them. So, when you cut off his fingers, his hand is still there, you can still do sujood. Cannot touch the hand. Don't touch the hand. Because this now is a place where he has to do sujood to Allah. Al Muqtasim really like this answer. This is very good answer. Logical, reasonable, and it's least harmful. The least harmful. Instead of the hand and the elbow. So he said, come to do it. This is what we need to do. Ibn Abi Dawood, Mufti Diyar, the Mufti, the Mufti. He says, I went home and I was so upset. I wish I had died 20 years ago. For three days, I did not go visit the Khalifa. Three days. After three days, he went to the Khalifa, to Al Mu'tasr. And he said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. It is important for me to admonish you, advise you, give you an advice. Even though, pay attention to this. Even though I know this advice of mine is going to take me to Jahannam. This is what he says. Subhanallah. Have you heard the Surah Al-Nas? Min shagal waswas khannas. Waswas khannas. This is one of the waswas of Thomas. الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة and what else? والناس. This is how the word. This is الناس. من الجنة والناس. This is one of them. Waswas of Thomas. والعياذ بالله. He comes to the Khalif. He says to him, يا أمير المؤمنين. I have to advise you. Even though my advice is going to take you to Jahannam. But I have to advise you. So what is it? He said, you had invited all these judges and all these muftis and all these people and asked them in the presence of the people about the hukum, where to cut the hand. And then you ignored all what we said and you implemented the hukum of what he called the child. The child. He refers to Imam al-Jawad because he's 25 years of age. 
And he used to call Imam al Jawad in Abu Dawood, he calls him Hadal al Aswad. Aswad means this black man. Because he was dark skinned. So he refers to him as Al Aswad. So he, he says, You implemented the teachings of him, his hukum, and the news got out to the people. The court was busy, many people were sitting. The news got out that the Khalifa took the opinion of this man and Jawah and ignored the hukum of the muftis and the judges and so on and so forth. How can you implement the teaching and the hukum of a man who so many people consider him the Imam and he should be the one sitting in the position of Khilafah, not you. You have just affirmed and confirmed their belief. I never realized. So I, this is what was the famous. He didn't realize, but this one, the Sayyidan came to him and told him. What are you doing? He says, What shall we do? We have to figure something out with this. This is a big problem. I didn't realize this. So then he plotted with Umm al Fadl. The wife of Ali Imam al Jawad, the daughter of Al Ma'mun, his niece. Because Umm al Fadl did not have children from the Imam. And Imam al Jawad had a child from his wife Sulayl, Imam al Hadi. So Umm al Fadl had this jealousy towards Al Imam al Jawad and towards his other wife, who had the Imam al Hadi. So he told her, You give him this poison, we will finish him. An important thing, brothers and sisters, Al Imam Al Jawad died because of Ahkam Allah, Hukm Allah, Deen Allah. Don't take the Ahkam lightly. Some of the youth, sometimes, or some people tell me, So what if we listen to music? It's okay, not a big deal. So what if we do Ghibah, Walayahu Billah? I mean, we pray, we fast, we do all these good deeds. Ghibah, Allah Ghafoor Rahim, Allah will forgive us. Our Imams got killed because of Allah, because of the laws of Allah. They got killed because of it. What, why did an Imam Hussain die, get killed in Karbala? Why? Because of Ahkam Allah, because of Kitab Allah, because of Sunnah Rasulullah. So then we come and say, oh, who cares? What do you mean, who cares? Our Imams got killed for the Sunnah of Rasulullah, for the Quran and the teachings of the Quran. We shouldn't take it lightly. So when we say treat your spouses with respect, have akhlaq, have compassion, treat your parents with respect, take care of your salat, take care of your deeds and aman, because our imams got killed for them. That's what pleases Allah. It's not for us to take it lightly and say, who cares? Allah Afum al Rahim. This is what Shaytan tries to whisper to us. Shaytan tells us, Allah Afum al Rahim, do whatever you wish to do. So the Imam al Jawad then was fed some poisoned grapes. And some narrations say poisoned milk. Either way. He took the grapes and immediately he started feeling the pain of the poison. I remember one time I was watching a video where a person had a glass of fresh blood. Fresh blood. And he put like a spoon into this blood. He stirs it. Blood is liquid, no, fresh blood. It's liquid. Then, then they brought somebody who, I guess, knows how to handle snakes. Somebody who knows how to handle snakes. He had a snake in his hand, and he managed to press the head of the snake in a manner where one drop, one drop of poison, the venom, fell into the glass. It was a big glass. It was about this big. And they were, it was all liquid, all liquid. The minute the drop of that venom fell into it, one drop, the whole blood clotted. Everything became like syrup, slush, where the spoon could not turn anymore. It could not turn the spoon anymore. And it became like solid. One drop of the venom of the snake. When I saw this video, I said, Salaam. 
our Imams, most of them got poisoned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we read, when they used to eat the poison, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to feel pain. Sometimes they would vomit clotted blood, blood wa riyadu Maybe they used to get these kind of poisons when they are looking up. These kind of poisons that they used to feed to our Imams. So the minute he ate that grapes, he felt the pain of the poison. His wife regretted. She started crying. She felt bad, guilty for what she had done. Imam Al-Jawar told her, Now it's too late. Allah is going to punish you for what you did. And indeed, she became ill with an illness that killed her later on. Anyways, Ali Imam al Jawad, he was a Harib in Baghdad. Al Mu'tasim had summoned him, told him to come in Baghdad. Al Imam al Hadi was in Medina. Al Imam al Jawad came to Baghdad. So he started feeling the pain of the poison, sallallahu alayhi But it didn't last for full time. He fell onto his bed and turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah wa billah wa ala millati jaddi rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He was alone, gharib in Baghdad. But at that moment, in his final moments, Al-Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam walks to his father and comes to him. And Imam Al-Hadi was also young. He was about 8 years of age. And he sees his father, 25 years of age, getting killed right in front of his eyes. It is not easy. He's standing by his father. He hugs his father, Al-Imam Al-Jawad alayhi salam And he cries, Abata, Aywa.